Coming to you from the West Coast, this is Politicos. Today is March 14th, 2018. It's Pi Day. And this is episode 77. Politicos is your weekly politics recap from a West Coast perspective. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe and leave us a review wherever you found us. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter where we're at Politicos Pod and support the show at patreon.com slash Politicos. I'm Scott Delingboom. And I'm Ian Bushfield. Today we're going to talk about Vancouver's failed World Cup bid and Doug Ford winning in Ontario, as well as a roundup of quick takes. But first, as always, we have to thank our premier sponsors, Lindsay Teds and Blake Hodson, for helping make the show possible. And Politicoast, as always, is in partnership with BC Today, British Columbia's brand new daily newsletter dedicated exclusively to BC politics. Sign up for a free trial to have unique coverage of the BC legislature delivered to your inbox every morning. Listeners to Politicoast will receive 25% off subscriptions when you enter the offer code Politicoast. For your free two-week trial of the newsletter, go to BritishColumbiaToday.ca. Uh, so you started a podcast. Yeah, uh, it's fun. <laughs> uh, it also is a good way to generate conspiracies on Twitter. So as we've mentioned, you're running for Vancouver politics, and it compromises our ability to talk as objectively about Vancouver politics without people either questioning how partisan you're being and then I feel like I either have to push back too hard or whatever. So we're pulling Vancouver politics sort of out of Politicoast for the time being and see where it goes. And at the same time, our friends at Pod Keep Our Land were in the similar situation, not with anyone running, but with Aaron over there working for the city and unable to talk about... She works in Metro, but a local governmental yeah, organization. Can't talk about municipal politics essentially during an election campaign. So they went, well, fuck. And so I talk with Patrick and Matthew over there, and together we came together over a bunch of beers on Sunday evening and recorded a teaser for what we're calling Cambie Report, a local politics podcast that will cover Vancouver municipal election and probably wrap up after that because running two podcasts is going to be a lot of work. Our goal is to try to bring on diverse and different voices, so we haven't recorded a full episode yet because we want to make sure there's a woman involved, so it's not just another bunch of guys on a podcast like every other podcast out there. And so we're still looking for suggestions for guests, for topics. I think Patrick's really interested in doing some historical lookbacks at what, how did Vancouver get in this situation, those kind of things, and then chasing the campaign as it goes because apparently it's really busy already as you know the teaser you can find at canbyreport.ca you can find the show on twitter and facebook and itunes at canby report and i may drop the first episode in this feed just as a teaser but then you can go there and that's the new show hopefully it goes well and yeah the conspiracy so when we launched we used a logo that one cease and desist letter said look too much like the BC government's logo. But one Max Fawcett on Twitter uh, tweeted out our page when it launched saying it was something like this is suspiciously well designed and in advance of the election. And then he wondered if we were a BC NDP AstroTurf campaign. Or also liberal. That was one of the other ones that... And he'd be fine with that as long as we were upfront about our AstroTurfing. With KMB Report, we launched that, and one Twitter person argued that because you were involved in it, Hector Bremner was involved in it, and Brendan Daw from Abundant Housing, it was just a supplyist bid to get the NPA elected, and none of those people have a finger on this project. Yeah, not at all. Like, I actually only found out your teaser launched after I saw you tweet about it. Like that That's how uninvolved I am in it. So... That's cool. It got us more controversy and doing well. Got us <laughs> stir shit to get clicks. It's the internet now. Going into our first segment, at least we won't have a World Cup riot. This is going to be an annoying story because I don't think either of us really care that much. But Vancouver's not getting the FIFA World Cup in 2026. Oh, drat. So there's a joint bid happening right now between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, where they're trying to say North America will host the 2026 World Cup and games will be played at stadiums all over and in cities all over the countries. And here's our bid. Vancouver was one of the considerations. 
only it turned out yesterday the NDP have been waffling a little bit on this in tourism minister Lisa Bear's words and later John Horgan's we don't want to just sign a blank check with FIFA who apparently were asking for some flexibility and open-ended contracts around the stadium so for example two years down the road FIFA might decide BC Place needs grass rather than AstroTurf and we'd be on the hook to replace that Now, because this is a joint bid between lots of different cities over a continent, Vancouver would ultimately probably see three or four games in total in the 2026 World Cup. And so replacing PC Place's turf for grass and whatever else might come up. Yeah, and and they also had to install a drainage system and everything if you were going to real grass. And there were requirements in there that needed uh, BC Place to be open, I believe it was 30 days or they had to have access, exclusive access to it for at least 30 days prior to the event all the way through the World Cup. So it just became a huge hassle and massive potential costs. It sounds like FIFA was being a stickler on every point, not wanting to compromise. And the NDP government, wanting to be, I guess, fiscally conservative or fiscally (laughs) responsible, went, no, we're going to hold back a bit and not you know sign away this blank check and this afternoon the bid committee of all of these north american cities said well vancouver's out because they're not playing nice and the city of vancouver gregor robertson tweeted out that he was very disappointed and released that from the mayor's office and the bc liberals were up in arms because this is devastating to bc's reputation and the future of Vancouver as a world-class city and sports fans were decrying it as like the end of the BC NDP as a government and they'll never get elected in Vancouver again. And yeah, I know there was a lot of pushback before the Olympics and even after the Olympics for how corporatist it was, how much it costs, how many people it displaces and all the sort of civil rights issues that sort of came up with it. And then there was also the financial side, too. And we were actually a fairly rare exception in terms of these massive sporting events when it came to the Olympics in that we actually came out not too bad on the money side. And that's, I think, maybe given us a rosier picture than the statistics really justify, because basically every one of these, whether it's the Olympics, the World Cup, it's... The host spends massive amounts of money, doesn't recoup the cost. Basically, every Olympics ends up in the red. Same with every World Cup. And not by small amounts, either. We're talking, you you can have an order of magnitude difference sometimes between costs and revenues on it. So, like, and it's actually leading to a place where there's not as many Olympic bids happening anymore. There's questions about, you know, whether some of the upcoming Olympics will even have bidders on them. And starting to have some of the similar stuff happening with the World Cup. And yeah, it's probably from a does this make sense economically and fiscally point of view, a good call to say, yeah, maybe we don't actually want to sign up for this. And that's not even getting into how terribly, evilly corrupt FIFA is as an organization. Like, wasn't it just a year or two ago when like a dozen of their staff got taken away in handcuffs for various bribery and other corruption charges like i think we're okay not doing business with these people just seems safer than paying the bribes to make sure we get here and then going through all this rigmarole and then the liberals and everyone would be going after the ndp for pissing away people's money on a few soccer games so it's kind of a lose-lose for the ndp but at least this way They went, you know what, we saved a bit of money, we're not going to play their game. And they were somewhat vindicated today even, as Chicago also pulled its bid, saying they didn't want to be part of the United bid. And the mayor there said FIFA could not provide a basic level of certainty on some major unknowns that put our city's taxpayers at risk. The uncertainty for taxpayers coupled with FIFA's inflexibility and unwillingness to negotiate were clear indications that Further pursuit of the bid wasn't in Chicago's best interest, which is basically the same line of argument that the NDP gave. 
Now, that's the easy ar- line of argument to try to kill this kind of bid. It's also just a good argument. <laughs> it's, yeah, the, there's a bunch of problems with these bid sporting events. And yeah, I think a responsible government shouldn't be going for them. I will say this in defense of the Olympics. I didn't not just enjoy it, but it was the catalyst to actually kick some very lazy governments into actually funding needed infrastructure like the Canada line, the upgrade to the Sea to Sky Highway, developing Olympic Village, even though that became a fiasco of its own that we don't need to get into. But with this World Cup bid, we would have gotten three games at a stadium we already have. So there wouldn't be new infrastructure. There might be fucking around with the stadium we already have because men can't play on AstroTurf, but women can. We had FIFA Women's World Cup, and it was fine. It was great. But men need something better because whatever. So, yeah, hopefully we're not losing all our many. I know we have at least a few soccer fans who listen, and I'm sure they're disappointed by our analysis, but kind of... When you watch the World Cup, you don't really care what city it's in. Like, if it moves cities within there, you're just watching the teams you want. So none of this made sense to me from the start. And kind of glad that they killed the bid. Uh, moving on to segment two, win for Ford Nation. Well, the Ontario Progressive Conservative leadership race wrapped up last weekend. Uh, so last episode, we had um, John Michael McGrath from Ontario's TVO here to talk about it. And, well, the results finally came in. And I mean, finally came in. Well, because... our episode wasn't as out of date as fast as I expected because he didn't know who would have won. And even when we were supposed to find out who won, we didn't know. Yeah, so the whole thing was a bit of a shit show, <laughs> to put it mildly. Okay. Yeah, it's supposed to be released around 1 in the afternoon, 12, I think, there. And, well, five hours later, nobody knew what was going on. Uh, there were issues around w- the counts and whether or not people were actually getting the their ballots assigned to the right riding. The injunction that we talked about did not go ahead. Nevertheless, they that didn't stop them from having massive problems with the voting count. So when the results were supposed to be announced, they just didn't have them they'd done an initial count Doug ford had won but there was challenges to it and like nothing was decided when it was supposed to be even following it on twitter because i didn't watch it live but it sounded like there was such chaos that they had done an online voting system after you had gone through all the id proving hoops and whatnot but you voted online which meant the count is actually really easy to do in theory In reality, it sounded like they saved them all to PDF, printed them all, and hand-counted them, which defeats all of the purposes of online voting. Yeah, it was a really weird... Well, I believe they didn't hand-count them. They scanned them into a counter. Right. Okay, that's better. (laughs) So it was slightly less absurd. But uh, keep in mind, this is a party that is running on finding efficiencies and... That process is anything but efficient. Yeah, we found some inefficiencies. (laughs) Trust these people to clean up waste in government. So a lot of this seems to have turned around the narrowness of the ultimate result because what was finally declared happened was Doug Ford won on the, was it the third of three kind of counts? Yeah, the final count. So took all the counts again. The NDP seemed to be the only party that could just choose a leader. Conservatives are not good at choosing leaders these days. But part of the problem for Doug Ford's claim to victory is he won on points, but he actually lost on the raw vote, and he lost on the number of constituencies. So runner-up Christine Elliott won more constituencies, but only narrowly. Doug Ford seemed to have just run massive scores in the suburban places where he's well known and won enough votes everywhere else that mathematically he won the point system which was the same as the bc liberals and the federal conservatives but it doesn't have that like yeah the the, the whole point of this writing weighted thing is to kind of balance out 
the popular vote, and the ridings. And in this case, it didn't do either. The person who lost the popular vote and the ridings won. So there's that thing. When that was announced, Christine Elliott immediately said she's not accepting it. She's going to start launching challenges. And that added further uncertainty to the entire situation. Yeah, and there's a several hours, I believe it was, where there's just a bunch of lawyers from the different campaigns and the head office just in a room trying to sort this whole thing out. And when you have a bunch of lawyers locked in a room, it's not a good sign usually. Especially when you're supposed to be announcing the results for a leadership race. Well, and they also had to announce them from just a random press conference later because they got kicked out of the venue that they were having their leadership contest at because they were there too long. Yeah, they, they said, they, we actually have to leave. Yeah, they their result was going to be out at 1, they booked till 7, and, well, by 7 o'clock, no results had come in, and the hotel basically said, don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. So they moved it to this just random room to do a press conference somewhere else. And they finally had the results. So Christine Elliott did eventually concede and lined up behind Doug Ford. And now he's the leader and the jokes have all already been made. The Beaverton, I think, ran with the we've replaced a sex offender with a drug dealer. (laughs) And others have just sort of pointed out that this is where you went because I think, as John Michael McGrath was saying, he's the somewhat anti-establishment. There was enough people who were frustrated at Patrick Brown and how he got treated in their view. And then if you look at the breakdowns of where votes went, Doug Ford ended up getting something like 80% of Tanya Granick Allen's social conservative fringe voters. But, well... They weren't fringe. They were like 15% of the vote there. It's the conservative party. They're they're not a fringe. She almost got as many votes as uh, Caroline Mulroney. And that, yeah, that was the surprise. uh, Just how much Mulroney underperformed. So Granick Allen's people helped Doug Ford to win just the same kind of way that perhaps Brad Tross people helped Andrew Scheer win in the end, plus a bunch of other things all went right. Farmers. Yeah. So Doug Ford has now also announced that he's going to rewrite the platform that they're going to run on going into the election. Because what you do when you're leading in the polls is scrap the playbook. <laughs> they don't they won't see that coming. Well, to be fair to uh Doug Ford, it's I don't think it was the platform that was leading them in the polls. It was well, just how massively unpopular Kathleen Wynne is. Just generic not kathleen win wins basically anything but when you're down to under 90 days to an election going we're going to throw out everything we'd planned and start from scratch yes the people's guarantee has apparently a very short self life and is in fact not a guarantee at all so ontario is lining up to be a continually interesting story for the next couple months is this all good news for Kathleen Wynne? It's not all good news, but there is less bad news, I guess, in the sense that Doug Ford is probably the most beatable of the major candidates that ran. Tanya Granit Allen's probably maybe a little more beatable, but I think Doug Ford has a higher likelihood of losing than either Carolyn Mulroney or Christine Elliott did. Although this is the same devil's bargain we were playing with trump or the americans played with trump and the republican nomination and that didn't turn out so well so i'm not super hopeful for yeah ontario's future nevertheless like a generic republican probably would have done better in some sense it's really hard to say but like there's i guess it's high risk high reward in that sense like there's, there's definitely a lot of ways in which this could go very badly for the pcs Well, the other thing I've seen is one of my friends who lives in Ontario in one of the more conservative places that only just went liberal in the last magic win victory. He was saying he's hearing from people who, in his words, would have completely forgotten the name Horvath, that they're actually open to thinking about the NDP in a way they wouldn't have been before. And that's 
an openness, not a vote yet, but we're not into the election campaign. And that random anecdote could be symptomatic of this. Well, we don't like Wynne. We hate her. We know that. Ford, huh? Well, there's this other option. And then you're getting into Bob Ray territory. <laughs> we all know how that turned out, though. So so we can look forward to Andrea Horvath's eventual career as a federal liberal cabinet minister. And Horvath days, when everyone <laughs> needs some, when the government needs to save some money. So we'll keep following Ontario politics and how it plays out. It at least turns the attention away from the petty trade wars we're doing out west still. Yeah, at least until Premier Dodd Ford starts his own petty trade war. Oh, man. <laughs> Justin Trudeau is not going to want to be prime minister for another term at that point. <laughs> Well, that's the other actually interesting thing is Ontario te- often does the uh, flipping of provincial and federal leaders. So you follow more of the what's the fundamental say sort of thing, the having opposite leaders kind of, yeah, does hint at where, where things might be going. But yeah, Kathleen Wynne is just so massively unpopular. It's going to be very hard for her to stage a comeback and... You know, she only managed to win re-election last time because the PCs shot themselves in the foot repeatedly. Which they may have just done again. Yes. A couple times in a <laughs> row. Yeah, this might be the third or fourth very winnable election the PCs have blown. So yeah, if you're looking for provincial politics drama, you know, maybe turn an eye towards Ontario because it's likely going to be a interesting few months, to say the least. Moving into our quick takes, this week, Andrew Weaver introduced a private member's bill, and he wants to, with this bill, lower the voting age in the province to 16 years old from 18. He argues this would get more people engaged, and in his own experience, he's met 16-year-olds who know more about politics than some 45-year-olds who don't stay engaged, and honestly, it was probably me when I was in high school, so... I am also supportive of this, and they've expanded the idea, or I've heard it floated around, of we could use the electoral reform referendum that's coming up as a trial, considering the people who get to vote in that will then be 18 when the next election comes around anyway, so they should sort of get to decide how they get to vote. And the NDP has expressed some interest in this proposal. Yeah, it's it's worth looking at for sure and that's really things to consider but yeah i don't think age is necessarily the best predictor of political knowledge that's for sure one of the things that is mentioned is scotland actually did this for the 2014 referendum allow 16 year olds to vote and it was successful enough there that they enshrined it as law there and now 16 year olds vote in every election and One of the things we know well from political science research is if people vote young, they tend to continue to vote more and more. So getting people to vote at 16, 17 can help build that civic engagement longer. And whether they're, you know, left when they're young and right when they're old or idealistic libertarians when they're young (laughs) and, you know, socialists when they're old, doesn't really matter as much as just building that engage with civil society and getting more votes out there. So hopefully this will be one of the few private members bills that makes it through. But like we've probably said many times, almost all of them are always doomed to fail. Well, while we're on the topic of BC Green initiatives, the basic income pilot that they've been pushing for and that made its way into the supply and confidence agreement uh, might be not happening anytime soon. It's been announced that it's going to be put on hold till at least 2020 the budget that just came out we mentioned i think included something like four million dollars for a basic income feasibility group or something like that no one really knew what that meant but it was clear that it wasn't enough money to do a pilot so questions sort of floated around in the back of the news cycle and it finally came out that yeah the ndp's approach is going to be to create another task force consultation send some academics to start studying the issue and probably not this year, probably not next year, but maybe 2020 
get to launching an actual pilot project here in BC. And this makes a lot of sense, to be fair, because right now there are ongoing pilot projects in Ontario and a few other places around the world. When you're doing a science experiment, you sometimes want to know what the results of similar experiments are going to be so you can do yours better. You can twist the dials a little bit differently. And this actually seems like something Andrew Weaver's fine with. I think basic income was in his platform, but it wasn't the number one, you know, if we don't get this, we're not joining government. He did want it in the supply agreement, like you mentioned, but I think he's fine to see it push down the road as long as there's still movement on it. And, you know, there are other things addressed in the budget that are addressing some of the affordability questions that basic income would try to get to. But at least we're getting some of the childcare things and a few of the other programs to really help people who are in need of that help. And while we build those, we can start thinking about could we, should we do a basic income in BC? And so it's nice to see it at least moving. It's not very fast, but you got to prioritize things. And this is down the list. Running the same experiment that's being run in a bunch of other places. Yeah, it might not be the best use of funds right now. And so, yeah, putting it off a little bit, it's not a terrible idea. One thing the Green Party is not as happy about is the ongoing battles over the Kinder Morgan pipeline. This week's seen a few small news pieces trickle out, as seems to happen every week around this debate. There was a massive protest on, I believe, Sun. There was a massive protest on the weekend against Kinder Morgan. They crowd estimates ranged from five to ten thousand people marching through Burnaby, a local indigenous group set up a watch house just outside the injunction because Kinder Morgan won an injunction so the protesters couldn't actually go right up to the construction site. So they set up this spontaneous watch house, which is actually a kind of cool way to do a protest. It's in uh, indigenous architecture style, and I forget the proper name for it. But the idea is they could have 24-7 protesters standing there watching the construction site, making sure nothing's happening. I mean, they can't do anything, but it's symbolic like most protests are. There was a CBC article trying to say there is this anti-pipeline protest, but there's also this pro-pipeline protest because there was a pro-Kinder Morgan rally, I guess, at Jackpool Plaza downtown where there was a couple dozen to 200 people. And a lot of people called CVC out on this for how they wrote it. And eventually they did correct their thing to say, we kind of conflated these a little too much to misrepresent that one protest was relatively tiny and one was relatively large. But this filled up my feed all weekend because all my friends are anti-pipeline zealots, as you'd expect. (laughs) So there's the protests. The other news was BC appointed prominent lawyer Joe Arve to lead our reference case. I don't know that Joe Arve actually does any, well, I guess he'll be paid for this, but he has done so much pro bono work for so many cases. He was the BCCLA's lead counsel on the Carter case that knocked down assisted dying law. He was recently the lead counsel on the solitary confinement case that was a nine-week trial that they won. And he's done a number of other major cases like this. So it's not surprising the BC government would turn to him to try to make this case. And we'll see where he goes with that. And finally, one of Alberta's ministers, Darren Billu, said, I think it was today, people in BC are a bunch of shitheads for trying to oppose this pipeline. And unfortunately, I couldn't find the audio for that because it. I think it was to a small meeting reporters were there and he apologized for that today because it's not a great look for a cabinet minister to be calling another province shitheads all in all though the pipeline is still underway and people are still pissed so we're basically in the same place as last week yeah well the the fundamental problem here is that it's a federally regulated pipeline and the, neither the municipalities nor the BC government has a huge amount they can really do on it. I mean, we'll see when the reference case settles out. But yeah, until then, going to go ahead unless Justin Trudeau changes his mind. Finally, there's a bit of a weird story in the Globe and Mail this week that made 
the rounds a few times on Twitter about Jagmeet Singh. And this relates to a protest or rally he attended in 2015 in California. So at the time, he was a sitting Ontario member of the provincial parliament, deputy leader, I believe, and had his record as a human rights advocate. So he gets a call from some group there that's holding this rally and says, hey, can you come down and speak? And he goes, yeah, I'd love to. And he goes and speaks and no one notices at the time or else it was just Ontario. So no one cared. But they dug this speech up and they found that some of the people at the speech were cheering for Khalistan, which is independent Sikh state of India. And tied to that movement is the Aryan Day bombing and the terrorist separatist Khalistanis and Sikh extremists of the 1980s and one of the posters behind where Jagmeet Singh spoke was of this Sikh separatist who was killed by Indian police in 1984 as part of this Sikh genocide which is part of what the protest was all about when there was this nationalist movement the Indian government cracked down excessively hard and a lot of innocent Sikh people were murdered essentially by the state and Jagmeet Singh and others have spoken out about this. Now this specific individual who was on the poster, I guess when he was killed in the temple, he was holed up and he happened to be holed up with a lot of arms and weapons and seemed like he wasn't planning to, you know, just have some fireworks or a show or peacefully protest for a Sikh state. He was seeming to plan a major attack on the Indian government or something. So the Indian government arguably had some justification. Now, there's a lot of politics here that I don't fully know, so with a grain of salt, but that's the rough overview of the story. Jagmeet Singh has released a statement in response to this Globe and Mail piece about the rally, only he doesn't really say anything about the rally. He just basically says that he rejects violence. He is in favor of human rights. He's in favor of right to self-determination. But he doesn't really address this issue of why were you at a rally where there were some independent Sikh separatists and this kind of thing. And it ties back to the questions Terry Molesky was trying to shove at him right after he won the election and came off very inelegantly, to say the least, when he was like, do you denounce Sikh extremism? And he was like, what are you doing? He didn't say no, but he also just didn't want to play the game. And now it's like a second piece in the Jagmeet Singh is a Sikh extremist conspiracy web that they're trying to paint. And it's, I think that's not fair, but his responses aren't helping. Yeah, I, 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 there's definitely a fringe element that goes for the full conspiracy, but there's also the, I think, a more mainstream element that's questioning whether or not he's I guess not an extremist but sympathetic might be the better way to phrase it might not be a fair characterization but it definitely exists out there I th think how I'm wrapping my head around it is by way of contrast Quebec separatism has had its violent pasts and has its violent elements modern Quebec separatism isn't though and has shifted to become more of a political movement a lot of which Martin Wallet and the block, like we spoke about last week, excluded, is focused on essentially just getting more special privileges to Quebec as an independent nation within, or as a distinct nation within broader Canada. And if Jagmeet Singh's view is that Sikhs in India should be able to advocate in the same way as the Quebecois can advocate in Canada, he should just say that, and a bit more directly, perhaps. But I also get that he doesn't want to probably wade too much into to the domestic policy of a foreign country, especially one he's banned from, ironically. And there's not a lot of evidence that I know of that Sikh extremism is a thing today the way it was 30 years ago, where it was a serious issue, including here in Metro Vancouver. So it that's where it comes off as a bit more on the paranoid, let's try and like get the gotcha, ha, this is the gotcha story that proves Jagmeet Singh is a radical <laughs> Sikh separatist of all things. But yeah, like you said, it's this evolving narrative that's going to plague him until he can figure out how to address this coherently and 
I don't know, maybe Canadians will, maybe a segment of Canadians will always try to hold it against him because underlying biases and things like that. So as a politics, there'll be a segment of Canadians that will hold basically anything against anyone. Because partisanship's a hell of a drug. Uh, I uh, I was quite frustrated, uh, but I should have used more diplomatic language, and so for that, uh, I am sorry. But you, you do prefer to use the word bullshit. Oh, not bullshit, sorry, shitheads. So that's, that's dirty. You guys can have to check the record. You had the cameras there. Okay, well, we saw tweets, so, yeah, shitheads. Yeah. Alberta has it all. Moving on to Best of BC Polly. First up is Shannon Waters, guest from last week, who uh, tweeted, Sure sign that spring has returned to Victoria. The green leader has been spotted in his summer plumage. And this is quote tweeting a picture Andrew Weaver posted of himself in a Hawaiian shirt with the caption, Stoked to be able to break out the first Hawaiian shirt of the season. Asked YYJ equals OGG. That's, I think, Maui's airport or Honolulu's. Okay. I had I to look to, it up. I, I used to know the airport codes a lot better. But definitely look up the picture of Andrew Weaver in it's his the, Hawaiian it's, shirt. It, it, it's just Andrew Weaver at peak Andrew Weaver. Between him tweeting that and John Horgan's pie joke today, which was just him eating 3.14 pie, we have like two dads running this province right now. And I'll take that over some of the other options that are running around. But speaking of Pi Day, the other best of BC Poly I ch- pulled out this week was from Bowen Ma, past recipient of this award, who tweeted today, after 5.1 Pi years of neglect in BC, we're working hard to turn it Pi Radians, smirking face, happy hashtag Pi Day, hashtag BC Poly, hashtag sorry, not sorry. For the non-mathematically inclined of our listenership, Pi Radians is a 180 degree or about face turn. I'm proud of our ministers. <laughs> if you have better tweets than that for next week's show, make sure to nominate them with the hashtag, hashtag best of BC Poly. And that has been Playcoast. Find links to the stories you mentioned in the show notes at playcoast.ca. Make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Playcoast Pod. Leave us a review and let us know what you think. Support the show and get early access to our interviews at patreon.com slash playcoast. And if you have ideas for the show, feel free to send it to us. Happy Tau over two day. Thanks for listening.